So I'm really delighted to be introducing our two speakers to you today, uh, David Paternotti from ULB in Brussels and Mika Verlu from Radboud University in Nijmegen. Um, and what they're going to be presenting to us is on the theme of political science at risk in Europe. The, they, they wrote a version of this in a chapter in our 50th anniversary book, the ECPR book on political science in Europe that was, that was edited by Boncourt Engeli and Garcia some months ago, but I believe that David and Mika have been working up uh, a longer and, and a different version of their original arguments. So I'm going to, without any further delay, hand the floor to them. They'll speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and then that'll give us time for some questions and answers afterwards. So the floor is, the floor is yours. So thanks a lot, David, and uh, for the invitation, and thanks also to Alex for the, the organization of, of all this lecture. Uh, so we're very pleased to be here today and, and to participate. Indeed, it would be nicer to meet in person, but still, it's very nice to be uh, to be here and also to allow so many people from different parts of Europe to join us for the lecture. So what we'll do today, and, and uh, as David uh, mentioned, uh, it's based on a chapter we wrote for the anniversary book of the CPR, and, and actually we got in, into this story, both Mika and I, uh, through two research interests, which are uh, or work on anti-gender politics on the one hand, including attacks on gender studies, and we're both uh, from gender studies and, and gender and politics, and also uh, through all work, and, and this is connected obviously on uh, democratic backsliding or whatever you call it uh, at the moment in Europe and in other parts of the world. And it's really connecting these two ideas that we, we thought, okay, there is something happening in the field of knowledge, and political science is not isolated from what's happening in uh, broader social sciences and humanities uh, today. And what we'll present today, I will share the, I mean, you can actually read the, the chapter and uh, I will have three slides later in the talk and I have added the, the link to the CPR website where you can download the chapter uh, so that you can actually read and, and we'll present uh, this, uh, this chapter, which was the first step in, in that process, which is really mapping uh, the state of uh, the relationships between political science and academic freedom in Europe. But we'll also discuss uh, uh, briefly uh, the second step we're in uh, at the moment, actually revising an article on cultural Marxism uh, in universities uh, in Europe with Mika. And, and this, is, this will be the end of the lecture. So to start, we'll, we'll start with three stories. I will tell you two stories and then Mika will tell you one uh, from different parts of Europe. And the first story is a French one, the second one is a Dutch one, and the last one is an Hungarian one. And probably you've heard that in February, uh, so not long, not long ago, the French Minister of Universities uh, declared on television that Islamo-leftism is a crucial problem for French society. And she says it happens actually in universities, and for that reason, she uh, has decided to ask the CNRS, or the, the French uh, research agency, uh, the, the research institution, to investigate, to start an investigation on the scope of that phenomenon in French universities and higher education. And in brief, the idea is that universities would be monopolized by the radical left, opening the door to Islam, and ideology would be increasingly supplanting research. This statement was confirmed a few days later, and it actually provoked a huge debate in France with uh, the main newspapers were full of declarations, statements, petitions, observatories, and whatever you can imagine. And it's actually the first time that the Minister of Higher Education uh, in France makes such a statement. It's not the first time a minister makes actually such a statement, but a Minister of Higher Education, yes. And it's even more interesting that this minister is herself a scientist, she's a biologist, and also that she's a liberal, she belongs to Macron's party, so she's not a radical populist, whatever far right leader. And uh, this debate, I mean, this is the first time, but at the, the same time, this debate is old in France, it has been going on for at least two or three years and probably longer. And it's a wider debate on universities and knowledge uh, on the use of concepts like race, race uh, that would be an Anglo-Saxon, as they call it, concept imported into France, uh, about post-colonial theories, intersectionality, gender, and more broadly about social sciences and humanities. You may know that France is the country that has a former prime minister who has delegitimized sociology as a whole as a discipline in a public statement a few years ago. And it was Manuel Valls, for those who do not remember. 
And a lot could be said about that story. Uh, what is that Islamo-leftism? Does it really exist? Uh, where does it come from? But I think what is important for this talk is really to keep in mind, I mean, what is interesting is that the higher education minister wants the country research institution to investigate colleagues in universities and look at what they're doing. And she does that not because she thinks it's important for science, she does that under pressure from society. And to give you an idea of those pressures, in December, uh, two conservative MPs from Les Républicains, so Sarkozy's party, also asked the chair of the, uh, the, the National Assembly in Paris to uh, set up uh, an investigation on the intellectual ideological drifts in universities. So you see it's part really of a wider debate about what's happening in university. And actually this French story is no exception uh, you have similar phenomena happening in other countries. The UK could, could be the UK could be another case, and uh, one a crucial case were the Netherlands. And, and actually, a similar investigation, similar inquiry happened in the in the Netherlands a few years before. And and there the debate is not about uh, Islamo leftism; it's about cultural Marxism. So other names to uh, designate a similar uh, sort of phenomena, and the idea again that among other things it would open the doors to Islam. And that debate reached Parliament already uh, in the Netherlands in 2017, and in 2018, the Dutch Royal Academy delivered a policy brief to the Dutch government on freedom of academic uh, science, uh, academic uh, freedom in the Netherlands. And uh, this project started as an investigation into the political preferences of academics, but that this was rejected. And then it became an investigation into restriction to academic freedom in Dutch universities. The answer, uh, fortunately enough, is that there is no serious restriction in, in the, uh, the Netherlands, apart from debates on impact and uh, uh, on funding, still uh, this investigation happened. And with this, I give the floor to Mika, who will uh, just uh, jump in with the third story. Um, we did not start with Hungary in, um, in our, our talks about political science at risk or social science at risk in Europe or academic science in, at risk in Europe, because we thought that Hungary is maybe the most blatant example and the one where the consequences have been most severe. So I would think, and we would think that you all did hear about it, but to, to recapitulate, it, it started in the summer of 2018 when Orban's government announced an intention, an intention to revoke the accreditation of gender studies programs. And, on the claims that they were ideolo ideological or not connected to the labor market. And um, we mentioned this start with the intention because at the time of this intention, there was hardly anyone noticing outside of gender studies. There was hardly anyone taking it serious also believing that this could really lead to the end of the acc accreditation of these tiny, small gender studies programs in, in Hungary. But it happened in fall 2018. And um, that um, was only just the beginning. It was almost a pilot of what could happen because we had in 2018 also um, a new law targeting Central European University um, where Central European University reacted to it and tried to, to respond to the formal objections to them um, and that uh, was not successful in 2017. The law was adopted and the CU had to relocate all its teaching activities to Vienna in 2019, where they still are. So they also had to stop programs for refugees, for asylum seekers and research projects um, related to migration. So it was not just the institution as such, but especially what it was doing. Linked to that, Hungarian scholars were attacked in society, as it were, under the cover of this strong um, aggression from the government. Lists of names published in media close to the government, uh, and so on. Stickers put on the doors of Jewish uh, scholars at uh, Hungarian universities um, uh, because they have this, this narrative against uh, uh, Soros. 
So the attacks on Central European University didn't, didn't stop the whole attacks on academia in Hungary, but they were followed by an assault on the autonomy of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, which is its main autonomous research institution. And it applied not just to social sciences, but also to, to STEM and economics. And other uh, academic institutions uh, linked to history or national library were also um, restricted, forced to relocate uh, without any, any proper uh, idea about it. So there is clearly, this example show there is clearly something the matter in Europe. There's something the matter, not just in these three countries, but we could find examples probably in all countries. And that, um, so we need to think about that. What, what is this academic freedom that we would need to properly do good research? So David, what is academic freedom then? Yeah, so before starting with uh, the, the actual, uh, the, the content of, of this talk, just a few uh, key notions. So about academic freedom, we, we take uh, the UNESCO definition, and I will just quote the UNESCO before adding a few things, uh, saying that uh, academic freedom is, and, and I start to quote, the right without constriction by prescribed doctrine to freedom of teaching and discussion, freedom in carrying out research and dissemination and publishing the results thereof, freedom to express freely opinions about the academic institution or system in which one works, freedom from institutional censorship and freedom to participate in professional or representative academic bodies. And two key uh, two elements are key to academic freedom. One element is that it depends on the observance of a set of, rule, of, a set of rules in a uh, knowledge production about how knowledge is produced and the second element that is key is that it is validated by a community of scholars and this is the relationship of one scholar to uh, to the peers i mean it's what you know for journals for instance as peer review and uh, these are the two conditions allowing uh, science to be free from uh, states and from the market at least uh, as, as it is designed and the two other elements that are crucial one is institutional autonomy and what happened to the central european university is a very good example of that so it's really the capacity for an academic institution to decide freely on the mode of organization the content of the formation so both in terms of substance what this uh, institution is trying to achieve and also in uh, the way it works for instance about appointing the head of the institution. The second key element is about the right of uh, free exception for researchers. Obviously, free speech is a right for every citizen. However, there's a difference with uh, scholars. This is the idea that scholars, when they talk about their own uh, matters of the research, have a uh, specific expertise that is fruitful and useful to public debate, which is different from uh, just a freedom of speech for every citizen. And something you see more and more in the debate is really a confusion, I'll come back to that, between free speech and academic freedom. And also uh, the idea that no, um, expertise and academic expertise is understood uh, is put at the level of uh, opinion with uh, academic expertise being just another opinion in the debate and uh, with that i mean what we'll do today is mika will talk first uh, about the the history of uh, political science and how uh, the, the relationship between political science and power then she will move to the relationship between science and the market and then i will take the floor again and speak about the frames that we found in these attacks and uh, the tools the weapons used by people and just uh, one minute about the methods what we did as i said is based first on our own participant observation in that community and uh, seeing uh, uh, attacks uh, also helping colleagues in different parts of uh, europe and beyond europe the second thing is about uh, in serving asking many colleagues so when we wrote the piece we we started to contact many people as many as we could across europe to ask them about what happened and talking to them it's also uh, watching what's happening in the press in uh, different countries in, in the languages we can read and finally it's about readings for the cases that have been already well documented like hungary or turkey mika yeah okay now political science uh, we are expecting as this is a house lecture of the cpr that most people attending uh, are familiar with this discipline uh, but then of course everyone will also know how complex political science is as a discipline with many, many different sub-disciplines uh, interpreting polit politics in very different ways. 
So we define political science as the study of power dynamics, both in the public sphere and more broadly. So this is a wide uh, definition. So it says politics can not be examined without understanding the wider society in which they take place. And that you will have to look into the complex relationship between political science and academic, political and social context to see what are the specific risks that political science is into at the moment. So when we distinguish between the relationship of political science to the polity and to the politics around that and to its relation to the economy and the market on the other hand, I think the first one is more specifically about uh, what constitutes a risk for political science. Well, the second one about its relation to the economy and the market is a more general one that, that also affect all the sciences uh, in academia. And um, the way we look at political science, we see different positioning uh, in there as to how political scientists uh, position themselves vis-a-vis -vis, uh, power. And this, um, this, we think, has oscillated always and is still oscillating between two different uh, positions uh, with a differentiated impact on research access to politics and the political as well as on uh, academic freedom. So the one pole of this is that political science uh, was aiming at knowledge production that supports existing power actors or institutions. And the other poll aims at providing more distance critical analysis of the origins and dynamics and impacts of existing power actors and institutions. And of course, this is a, a, a continuum uh, and not, not, not just a binary uh, distinction. And uh, political science is particularly exposed, we think, because of this unique ambition of dissecting and analyzing the actual working of uh, power. And you can, in the, in the context of the history of the ECPR, you can see that, for instance, I remember that after 1989, a lot of colleagues were hesitant to include political science from the then communist, ex-communist countries, because they thought that under such circumstances, it was not possible to be a true political scientist. So, so seeing that those people were so close to power that this would uh, contaminate, let's say, their understanding of political science. So historically, I think, um, political science was developing as a science of power and government. And it remains so in, in many contexts. You can see that still uh, in um, the numerous schools of government that exist and the proximity to, to power and to law in many countries. So this makes political science attractive to the powerful who can see it as a means of getting more knowledge to consolidate power. Political science produces also political engineering knowledge that can be used to justify and to secure power. So um, um, Spanish political science uh, developed strongly under Franco with a key involvement of crucial figures of the regime, for instance. And uh, there's other chapters in the book that this chapter uh, is that also looks at these limits of scientific socialism in Central and Eastern Europe. So if political science is really close to power, intertwined with, or it doesn't have enough distance to political powers, then constraints on academic freedom are likely to be expected. But at the other end of the spectrum, when political science has emancipated itself from the state, um, and develops more independent knowledge about political dynamics uh, in, in uh, the polity, but also in social movement, then the study of politics is broadened to the politics in society at large. But this distance that then results from actual political power uh, might not be appreciated from by actual political power. And academic freedom might be at risk because of that, I think the examples in, in France and in the Netherlands clearly show that. The example in Hungary clearly show that. So the, the three examples that we have actually are more about the risks involved to this critical distance from political power. And that um, in Europe today, uh, the study of formal politics is still dominant within the discipline, but this broader study of political dynamics 
around formal political arenas and, and, and movements is also uh, still uh, prominent and necessary. So in, in practice of political science, you find positioning all over this uh, spectrum. And scholars who are close to political power can expect to have good access to political actors and processes. But there is a condition of being useful somehow, visibly useful, delivering good candidates for administrative positions or political positions. And their degree of academic freedom can depend on the openness and the democratic nature of political power. And this dependence on the democracy um, in which the policy is, is also important for colleagues located at the other end of the spectrum that need a free and open society to fully criticize political power as it functions. And in between both ends of the spectrum, um, you can say there is uh, researchers that are developing new types of critique or new types of critical analysis that are highly salient. It's, uh, I think, this focus on islamo gauchism or on uh, banning researchers from studying migration is very clear uh, attempt of blocking certain types of research uh, in political science and especially those people uh, seem highly vulnerable to direct attacks from political uh, actors. So whatever the exact positioning of uh, political uh, science, the, the current conditions of polarization uh, are very risky for political science. And this is the more so because we think that political science has already been weakened as have most other social science by the academic capitalism. So I turn to the second uh, line, the academic capitalism that has transformed universities to such a, a large uh, degree. So this restructuring, this neoliberal restructuring of universities has impacted the conditions of academic freedom in Western uh, countries um, through all sorts of mechanisms that favor competition um, and um, measurement of uh, so-called excellence. It's a bit of a ironical that uh, this lecture is today, I should be on strike today, or should be on academic strike today in the Netherlands because of a, a protest, um, national protest against the underfunding of universities in the Netherlands. That's clearly the result of this neoliberal restructuring. So the neoliberal politics of academia have clearly also decreased the institutional autonomy directly and indirectly making universities not just dependent on the state and the degree of democracy in the state, but also uh, dependent on the market. And that um, this is then also used by authoritarian governments or governments that are involved in autocratic attempts to further restrict uh, academic freedom. Uh, I recall what I uh, mentioned in the beginning that one of the arguments of Orban to close down the accreditation for gender studies was that it was not connected to the labor market. It didn't uh, prepare people for proper jobs in the labor market, which first of all wasn't true, but second was an argument clearly um, borrowed from uh, within this uh, discourse of academic uh, capitalism. So the, I don't know if we should go more on, maybe not on, on the, the full extent to which this academic capitalism has already um, limited the degree of uh, academic uh, autonomy. But um, this, we think that to a certain extent this new public management that has resulted from that, um, which, which has inspired procedures of hyper detailed monitoring uh, has resulted in an academic panopticon, uh, which reduces the space for free thinking anyway. And the resources uh, came with that. So that um, uh, we think that all in all the situation is quite worrisome. 
And um, we don't see any developments going against it. On the contrary, I think the example from France that David started with is the most recent one. Um, in comparison to that, uh, Orban seems like light years ago, but it is not light years ago. It's, uh, it's, it's all speeding up rather than slowing down. So our talk today is also meant to make sure everyone is aware of the risks and we can start debating what exactly, how to respond to them. So David, maybe you can start with a, a, a better understanding of what these attacks are. Yes, yeah, so as Mika has uh, already presented, I mean, the, the first idea was to look at the context in which these attacks happen. And, and actually, the neoliberal discourse is, is also used, including by Viktor Orban, for instance. So, so it's a discourse that is uh, the background and, and the relation to power is something that shouldn't be forgotten about the specificities of political science as a discipline compared to other uh, social sciences. And, and here what we try to do is, is really uh, looking at what would be the main frames we could find in these different attacks. They're probably uh, not the only ones, but the, the ones that were most salient trying to organize a little bit the, uh, the reflection, and then we moved to the weapons. And, and about the, the frames, what is important, we have five frames, and I have prepared uh, a few slides, uh, three slides, just to, to help you uh, understanding, uh, to, to understand this. And what is important to understand is that these uh, frames are not necessarily specific to political science. They're not mutually exclusive in the sense that can be used by different actors in different ways and they're often combined and that will become clear with the examples. But generally what they try to do is to uh, present science as ideological and therefore to attack science as uh, uh, being an institution that has some uh, rightful claims to, to truth. And usually these attacks come from people outside of academia, but sometimes they're also from within, but generally when they come from within, it's for instance, academics talking about outside of their field of expertise. For instance, if you look about the current French debate on race and, and the use of race as a, a sociological and political category, the people attacking it, are, I don't know why, but many of them are linguists talking and attacking social sciences. And, and this is something that happens in, in many countries. And finally, what is important is that these attacks do not necessarily come from people or groups with a religious or far-right backgrounds, but they can also come often with people using um, the language of enlightenment and sometimes also of positivism. So it's not only something uh, from a specific ideological groups. So the, the, the first idea is that uh, academics are some sort of elite. So it's really some uh, kind of populistic argument saying that opposing academics to uh, average citizens, uh, saying that academics are not a privileged group. And for that reason, they do not understand what's happening on the ground. They do not understand the population because they're too far off and, 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 and too isolated from, uh, from them. And against that, and this is a sort of argument you know, for instance, from Donald Trump, but you have uh, Erdogan has spoken the same sort of language against the academics for peace. And you find it all, you have tons of, of example coming from both actors on the left and the right. So it's something, an argument that is shared also across the political spectrum. Uh, the idea is really that, um, I mean, against these academics who do not understand uh, people's situation, you need often common sense, common sense as being opposed to science. And it's often something that goes with anti-intellectualism and, and something that, uh, that is definitely becoming stronger today in political debate is uh, the uh, uh, some sort of anti-intellectual uh, statement. The second uh, uh, sort of argument, and, and this is something that will resonate in the UK, for instance, is the, uh, the idea of absence of free speech. And we have had it for the right because they're usually the ones claiming it. But the idea that because of political correctness and uh, be, uh, beyond that, uh, because of some powerful groups, certain truth can no longer be said. You cannot say what you think you should be uh, saying as an academic uh, because some groups are blocking that. So there is no uh, free speech for all academics on uh, campuses. The, uh, and often here, what you see and, uh, is the idea that you have a confusion between academic freedom and free speech that we have developed at the beginning and, and that we can discuss later in, in the talk if you're interested. The, the third kind of frame is the frame about what we have called identity politics. So it's really the idea that uh, universities are confiscated by various sorts of minorities who do research on their own minority problems or, I mean, 
what some people have called grievance studies or me studies. And the idea that through that, what is lost is uh, science as uniting people. And the, the objective uh, and the goals of science as being universal and, and not about little tiny problems. And beyond that also the idea that science would be more and more promoting cultural relativism or political correctness. And then you go back to uh, one of the other frames we have already presented. And because of that, you will have fake science on the one hand, and the, uh, on the other hand, you would have universities becoming a dangerous space uh, for white heterosexual men who would no longer be able to speak as freely as they were doing before. And obviously you can recognize people like Jordan Peterson in that sort of argument. Then fourth uh, argument, and this is the one we're working on at the moment, is the idea of cultural Marxism. So cultural Marxism uh, being that idea that the left, especially after the, the wall of the Berlin Wall, has understood that the way to win power and to conquer power was to invest in the world of ideas, to take ideas and, and on their side. And if you want to uh, produce ideas, obviously universities are an interesting place uh, to work on. And uh, because of that, universities would be today uh, victims of the hegemony of the left. And this is a discourse, for instance, that you find in the Netherlands a lot, as, uh, as we have already mentioned. And when Thierry Baudet, so the new leader of the Dutch far right, won the uh, provincial elections a few years ago, one of the first, I mean, in, in this uh, winning speech, in this victory speech, he said that he would clean, that he would uh, fight against the different forces undermining the Netherlands. And among those forces, you had obviously universities. And that has an impact, and I'll go back to that in a second. And, and the final frame is the idea that academics are unproductive or that academics are lazy. Uh, the idea really, and, and this converge with the idea of neoliberalism, that academics don't do much, uh, that they're just, they, they waste uh, taxpayers' money, and then they shouldn't be protected too much, and they shouldn't be uh, given uh, the freedom to think and, and, and to speak and uh, produce uh, as they want. So these are some of the main frames we, we found uh, when uh, serving and, and talking to people. Then we moved to uh, the weapons and we try to understand how those attacks actually happen uh, beyond uh, just uh, hostile discourses across Europe. And we found two types of uh, weapons. Uh, the first type is really business as usual, is really using what we call bureaucratic weapons or uh, using the tools of academia and the management of knowledge and, and science against uh, academic freedom. And then you have uh, another set of attacks uh, that we have called external, just because they're not uh, made using the tools of uh, science management, but they're, they're just made using other tools often uh, from social movements. So uh, the, the first kind of weapons, the, the weapons, I mean, the, the first one, and, and that's obvious in the case of Hungary, is the idea of accreditation accreditation. So basically to give an accreditation to an accreditation, sorry, to uh, certain fields of knowledge. So it can be gender studies and gender studies have been under attack, but it can be something else. For instance, in Poland, they decided to erase ethnology and social anthropology and to merge them with other things and to redesign the sort of disciplines you have and, and the way they're organized or the sort of degrees you can give or can no longer give is one way to, uh, to influence uh, what is actually research. A second way that is obvious is funding. And there is, on the one hand, the whole neoliberal uh, understanding of funding that Mika has already mentioned, but there is also other uh, more direct decisions about uh, not giving, uh, not funding certain researches. And two examples, one is, uh, for instance, on, at an individual level, uh, re decisions in, across Europe by different uh, science uh, authorities not to fund projects, although they had all the green lights through peer review. So projects that had gone through all stages of, of evaluation and were rejected for probably more political reasons at the end of the process. And the second uh, uh, understanding is just to decide not to fund the whole field of research. And, and this does not happen only in Hungary. And, and one example we mentioned is the, man, uh, the, the example of the region Ile-de-France, so the, the region around Paris in, in France, where when the right came back to power in 2015, they decided to stop funding gender studies, for instance. And these are examples that happen elsewhere. Then uh, the third example is about censorship and, and self-censorship. Censorship is really direct interventions from actors from outside of science to block the content of research. So it can be a minister intervening in uh, the questions of a survey. 
it can be uh, the Lega Nord in Italy attacking colleagues in Bologna because they thought that uh, Lega Nord shouldn't be uh, listed under the label of far right party. Or it could be also myself sometimes uh, fighting against, uh, I mean, I was also the, the head of uh, one of the two gender studies master in Belgium, fighting representatives from the government because they would like me to teach gender studies in a certain way which is not the way that me and my colleagues would do. So that's one uh, kind of example, and, and there are many of them. Uh, another example is the Terry MP in Britain that asked for a list of scholars teaching European studies in Britain in the context of Brexit. So you see it happens on, on lots of different topics. And uh, however, censorship is not the only problem and maybe not the main problem. Uh, what you see more is self-censorship. So you see colleagues cleaning their syllabus, their CVs, their courses, uh, to make sure that there is nothing controversial, that they would, there's nothing that would expose them to some sort of attacks or criticisms. And, and this is something happening more and more. For instance, in Britain, again, it happens in the context of uh, anti-terrorism. Fourth uh, element, very uh, famous also from Hungary, but not only, you can just close a department or you can close a university. So you know about the Central European University forced to move to Vienna, but this happened before with the European University in St. Petersburg. And at a, a smaller level, it may happen against one specific department or center that is closed for some obscure reason. And, and we have different examples uh, for that. And finally, and something we're more and more interested in is creati creating alternative academic venues and outlets. So it's about creating uh, new academic journals, sometimes that look like academic journals, but are not. And this refers to what Andrea Peto would call the polypore university. Uh, but it's also about creating new academic institutions. And, and you may know that Marion Maréchal Le Pen is, for instance, busy uh, running a political science institute in, in, in Lyon and in Madrid. So starting a new alternative political science school uh, outside of French universities or Spanish universities. And then beyond that, you have also external attacks, uh, external weapons. So the first one is about uh, harassment, stalking, personal threats and attacks, and it is amplified by social media and especially by Twitter. And, and, and the most uh, extreme example, and we know many colleagues who have surfed for that, are dead threats. So you now we have many colleagues, some, some of them we know, and maybe you know them as well, receiving that sort of, of threats uh, in their mailbox often. Second sort of thing you get is uh, naming, blaming, blacklisting scholars and discipline. In many countries, not only in Hungary and Turkey, uh, France would be a very good example of that. You have newspapers or websites publishing lists of problematic scholars. So if you read, for instance, uh, in the context of discussions about post-colonial and racial studies in France or about intersectionality, magazine, newspapers, journals have been full of lists of people who should be uh, either expelled from fresh universities or even attacked and, and, and killed and uh, some of them are those who received the, the death threats recently. Third example are protests. People just uh, protesting against academic events. Again, lots of example that goes from a uh, Polish nationalist protesting against the teaching of Shoah in Paris uh, two years ago, to uh, people, uh, far-right leaders protesting in Verona against a, a conference on uh, LGBT migrants, or it can be also about the teaching, I mean, the discussion of uh, Judaism at the Jewish Museum in Berlin a few years ago. So protests made often by uh, civil society groups, different sorts of groups that can come from the, from the, the right, but also from the left. Sometimes, uh, for instance, the whole debate about trans rights or surrogacy is a good example of that sort of protest. And uh, also sometimes coming from certain states protesting about the organization of certain events in certain places, like it happened at the Jewish Museum in, in uh, uh, Berlin a few years ago. Fourth element is the idea of record and report. So different sorts of actors asking students to record uh, uh, scholars, to record lectures, and then to publish, to expose what has been said in, uh, during the course, which was one of the reasons why colleagues were so reluctant to record their, uh, their lectures during the pandemic, because that could be one of the risks. And I mentioned Thierry Baudet in the Netherlands before, this is actually something he tried to implement in, in the Netherlands, it did not happen. But uh, after saying that university were one of the main problems for the Netherlands, he said that people should report to a hotline, uh, uh, to, should report the controversial scholars. IFD in Germany uh, was also suggesting similar ideas, and, and I'm sure you have that in other parts of Europe. 
Fifth element is the uh, constraints of freedom of circulation. That works both ways. Either you prevent scholars from traveling, as if you don't want them to go abroad or to, to pursue the career to go, for instance, by going to conferences, and this happened in Turkey, for instance, or you just uh, do not allow scholars to get in your country, something that Israel does very often, for instance, if you do not agree with the ideas of uh, the people. And finally, you have all sorts of legal and uh, uh, police means, so policing and prosecution. So that goes from blackmail and surveillance to real prosecution and incarceration. So you have more and more scholars who have to face trials or put in jails uh, for uh, issues for connected to their work as scholars. And that goes from Catalonia to Turkey. So it's not only in authoritarian states. So after this broad overview, Mika will try to, to, uh, to mention what we could do, and then uh, I will end with a few critical points for the discussion. Yeah, this lecture is, is partly also to, to make sure more people help think what uh, good responses could be and more people would start doing something as a, a response. Uh, because so far, I think uh, it's clear that better responses are needed, both in terms of prevention, um, knowledge production about it, and protection of, of scholars. Um, so there's more and more colleagues we think that are becoming scholars at risk, and there is a need for protection of them at all uh, levels. And I think, first of all, I think it would be um, wrong to not take this seriously. When we started to work on the chapter, this is uh, three years ago, and uh, many people thought it was a very exotic type of topic, like political science at risk in Europe. Really, what are you talking about? And um, unfortunately, ever since, we, we, we don't lack any examples of what is happening. And I think, given the, the overview that uh, David just gave, I think many of you might realize also the extent to which this is pervading uh, our work and our uh, societies. So it's not just talk. Moreover, this is, in if you see this aggression as part of autocratic attempts in Europe as connected to de-democratization and to increased polarization, then you see that this is, uh, uh, this is part of a trend that nobody has yet uh, seen as slowing down or uh, passing over or something. So the, the belief that academic institutions are strong and resilient enough, I, I think is clearly uh, not realistic what happened has shown their fragility and um, the speed with which they can be attacked and uh, dismantled. Um, I think when I first heard, for instance, about the personal attacks to colleagues in Hungary, um, I had the mistaken idea that this, of course, could never happen in the Netherlands. But we had the same thing happening just after the elections, something called Vizir op links, putting stickers on, the, on the, the front door of people's houses, uh, scholars that are researching migration or, or similarly topics that are uh, not uh, favored by the extreme right in the Netherlands, uh, showing like, we know where you live. And um, so this is, this is, these personal attacks are a clear problem with that. So, so we think what is needed, first of all, is a, a better and more systematic research into this. Uh, we need better knowledge. Uh, I know we already uh, got a lot of uh, data collected for this, uh, for this work, uh, but we can still not assume that we know what is happening. We cannot take, uh, we, we cannot have a full account of what's happening in all these countries in Europe. So we need to collect much more empirical uh, material in order to understand what exactly happens and who is most uh, at risk? What are these oppositional frames and how are they developing? So our, our current work is linked to this frame of cultural Marxism because it links uh, a number of uh, elements in there and seems to be globalizing in a sense, seem to be diffusing more widely. Um, but we need to understand more clearly how these different frames, are they all different ones? Are these, uh, is this idea of elites is clearly uh, a framing that um, is very understandable within far discourse because 
they're all against the elites. If academics are part of the elite, they don't need to explain anything uh, further. Uh, so that's, that's uh, but we don't know much uh, about it. We need to also know more clearly how this neoliberal restructuring of universities is leaving universities so vulnerable uh, to do something uh, against it. And, um, and how these uh, growing attacks are linked to the processes of de-democratization uh, and autocratic attempts uh, in Europe. So, so I think there is a, a stronger uh, line of research that is needed there. Uh, myself, I, I looked, for instance, at, at what the far right parties in the Netherlands um, did in terms of voting and um, um, taking a position uh, regarding higher education. And that's very much in line with all these attacks, even uh, if you look uh, back 10 or 12 years ago. So, so this is something that probably will not change because it's in line with their whole understanding of uh, society. So we need to have more research about that. Um, and given the current neoliberal conditions under we, in which we work, is not easy to, to find uh, larger sums of money to do more systematic uh, research about that. But still, that's a very reactive approach. You see something happening. As a scholar, the first thing you want to know is let's research this, let's find out more about how this goes. But we, we crucially need to protect uh, both the discipline and the scholars working in the discipline from these attacks. And um, we need to try to prevent it as well. So that's, that's a, a need for more substantial uh, responses. Um, sadly, I think if you look at a uh, Central European University who tried a more pragmatic response to these attacks by Orban uh, in trying to go to court, uh, produce legal material that went against all the specific accusations against them, debunking them. Um, the pragmatic approach clearly didn't help because as soon as they had debunked the one thing, um, another uh, line came up or the government just didn't take them into account, their arguments, and went on with their plans uh, anyway. So regarding, first of all, the protection of people, uh, there is currently not much in place. And of course, this could be done, what could be done to protect um, individual scholars can be done at several levels. So if you look at uh, the fact that we are mostly uh, European Union countries, sorry for the UK people here, um, that um, the European Union could play uh, a leading role, but has not done so, so far. So they take into account uh, that you have to have a gender equality plan now for a Horizon Europe project, but they don't take into account that there should be a condition that scholars can work autonomously. They could, they don't. Um, so there could be direct funding from the European Union for projects about that. It could be conditions uh, set to money that they uh, give out and um, they could work on the east-west and the north-south divide in Europe because uh, across this, uh, there is also uh, a large uh, improvement that can be uh, made. We see some responses already at the level of universities, of group of universities, like the European, European University Association or the network of universities from the capitals of Europe. Um, but they, they there is not a clear protocol yet uh, or an idea what to do in worst case scenarios and how to provide sufficient uh, financial, legal, psychological and social support for scholars uh, at risk. So if I'm attacked tomorrow, I don't know where to go in my university and who will protect me. Uh, I think David, David's university is slightly more proactive in they to have they have a program on scholars at risk as well, but um, my university so far does not have that. Um, separate universities, separate uh, departments can uh, build on concrete examples to show solidarities with colleagues in more hostile uh, contexts, as some of them have done. So in 2019, um, a couple of these associations issued a joint statement um, also to have better approaches in the new Horizon Europe program, but that had not materialized. And um, 
There are some fellowships for scholars at risk also, but um, when we had a seminar on this in Brussels, no? Organized by Christian Orosel at the time, uh, we also saw that most of these programs are for one year. And uh, what we know from our research is not that this is not one year problems. So you can give a fellowship to a scholar at risk, but then what? Then after that, they go where? No? So th this is uh, laudable, but uh, a limited type of uh, response. And if they would, if all universities would have this type of problems, uh, programs, it would already uh, be better. And we also think that um, the ECPR should have something. I think David Farrow is the new president of the ECPR, and uh, they could. Uh, develop ideas how to do, uh, how to protect their scholars uh, better, how to ensure that conferences they organize uh, or um, can be attended by all sorts of people, that people who present research at these conferences will not be endangered because of what they do, and um, that uh, we count on them, we count on them, right? And, um, I think they could also be spaces to set up an observatory, like to make sure that there is uh, one central point where information about this is gathered and a help desk for scholars at risk in Europe where they can try and find uh, support. So this of course does not mean that we think that these um, attacks that are currently originating mostly in, in far right and neoliberal um, backgrounds in, in Europe are, are the only problem that political science has. And um, political science is still not a very diverse discipline. And uh, it still is in need of being decolonized. Uh, there's still a lot of problems that are ongoing and they need to also uh, be followed up. But um, yeah. We think that many colleagues are still quite naive in, in understanding um, what is happening right now. We do hope that we are wrong, uh, but so far that has not been shown to be the case. So we need to reflect on the purpose of the discipline. If we want to be able to also critical, critically study political power and um, politics in, in Europe, we need to, to find out how to make sure we can do that for the years to come so that political science is not just for those who are in power. Yeah, and I will end with three ideas for research. Uh, first, I mean, which is research and beyond research and echoing what Mika said is really we need to think and rethink the role of science in society relation from uh, of science to politics and and we talked about the pendulum this is crucial especially for political science uh, especially as it is involved also in policy making for instance second thing is we need to, to reflect the relation to civil society and the relation to the market and what we want to say with that is uh, really to not to fall into the illusion of some sort of positivistic ivory tower mm -hmm. and uh, not to fall into the the, the idea uh, that just good science will prevail. Uh, actually, we, we do not think that in, in, in current political and social debates, uh, good science is making a difference in, in terms of protecting academic freedom, unfortunately. Second uh, idea uh, is as really, I mean, what we have talked uh, about is really academic freedom attacked by state and especially uh, more and more authoritarian states. We also need to think about uh, how academic freedom can be endangered by civil society groups. Or we need to be able to uh, to conceptualize more in in the way that civil society can have an impact on uh, academic freedom and attacks on academic freedom. Having said that, we still need to keep in mind that often, not always, but often, civil society organizations have less power than states, and that there is a huge diversity among civil society actors. So the Catholic Church, for instance, is something very different from a student's group. Although the student's group can make a lot of noise, it remains a student's group. So we need to be able to, to think about where is power in these uh, civil society groups. Another thing we need to, to take into account are these uh, gongos, for instance, those these uh, governmental NGOs and civil society groups that take the appearance of a civil society group that actually is not entirely or not really a civil society group, something that has been analyzed by many colleagues, for instance, in Hungary, 
And, and finally, and the crucial thing that we, and, and what we're working on at the moment is really to think that uh, just denouncing or listing uh, academic uh, attacks on academic freedom is not enough. And, and while we have been working on that, we thought, okay, no, we're really reactive in a sense that we're trying to defend ourselves and, and to try to understand what's happening to uh, colleagues. But at the same time, there is something else happening. And uh, our intention and this focus on attacks is actually uh, overshadowing uh, another important part uh, of what's happening. And this is what is actually under construction. Again, the case of Hungary is, is, is very clear, but this is not the only one. At the same time that Orban is attacking certain institutions or certain fields of research, is also promoting other ones, promoting other institutions, promoting other sorts of sciences, and, and this is just an example of what we think we need to understand both uh, the attacks, but also to have a more proactive uh, uh, approach to what is currently under construction. And in, in a piece that we're currently revising on cultural Marxism, we try to do it with uh, the far right and, and how they've used this frame of cultural Marxism, both to understand what was happening to their uh, understanding in universities. So this idea that universities had been uh, conquered by uh, what they call the left or liberals, uh, often it's the same thing uh, for them, and uh, that these, uh, there would be this uh, hegemonic left in universities. And at the same time, it also worked as a program for them because they basically try to achieve the same thing. They try to fight what they could see as the hegemonic left in the world of ideas by promoting other ideas and trying to create a space for them in these uh, knowledge production institutions. And this is just an example of what we need to understand. And uh, we need to put much more into the debate and into, into, into our reflection, what we have called after other scholars, uh, the politics of knowledge. And to understand that knowledge is political, science is uh, political in the sense that you have different actors fighting to produce what is science. And that as a discipline studying power, we cannot remain outside of uh, these uh, attempts to understand knowledge politics. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, thank you both. This was a very thoughtful, uh, fascinating and depressing at the same time talk. But I, your message, your fundamental message that it's time for political science to stop being pragmatic and reactive and to start being more proactive, I think is a very strong and important message to follow. I'll just mention for what it is worth, the ECPR under Christy Shower's leadership has already started a Scholars at Risk Fund. Um, and a Scholars at Risk initiative, but it is admittedly at an early stage and definitely something that we need to build on proactively over the years to come. So again, I'm grateful on behalf of everyone who's been here to listen to this lecture and just again to thank you both for a fascinating and important piece of research and to wish everyone all the best. Thank you. <laughs>